Welcome to the fourth lecture on this course for optimization methods for machine learning and, and engineering. Today's lecture will be on equality constraint optimization. But before we dive into the main topic of today, let's have a look at some recent example where we see the effects of, of overfitting, overfitting which we saw earlier in the course. So there was uh, this year a publication in Nature, so the most prestigious journal, uh, that uh, there was evidence now for phosphine gas on, on the planet Venus. And this uh, was a, a small uh, sensation because uh, the phosphine gas could not have been of a normal origin on Venus, but it was a hint towards life being present on Venus. And uh, so the researchers were looking at the, at the spectral signature coming from, from Venus and they were fitting a 12th order polynomial and uh, they found evidence uh, for the presence of phosphine gas. However, and there was now a, a rebuttal, so people have been looking at this uh, fitting of the 12th order polynomial and uh, didn't find the evidence that, that was claimed. Uh, so here we had uh, an example of an overfitted result being published in a very prestigious journal and uh, people are now backtracking on the results and it seems that there is no life on Venus and that the phosphine gas that appeared to be there was, uh, was uh, a phantom and, and not really there. And um, well, fitting a 12th order polynomial is um, quite wild. You have to take precautions to prevent overfitting and uh, apparently those were not, not present in this publication. So uh, here again we have um, a slide or a small figure from, from an earlier lecture that shows you the, the problems of, of overfitting by going to, to polynomials of too high an order. And um, to, to give you also a small, uh, a small historical remark, John von Neumann, John von Neumann, a famous mathematician, he, he said that with four parameters he can fit an elephant and with five parameters he can make the elephant wiggle his trunk. So uh, you have to be careful that you do not use too many parameters. Uh, nothing good can come of that. Okay, now what uh, will be the content of today's lecture, the agenda? We will see some more concepts of linear algebra that we will need today. Uh, then equality constraints will be introduced with uh, an example and also with some formal definitions. And uh, later we will two ways to work with equality constraints. So first of all constraint elimination, how to get rid of constraints to get to a optimization problem that has a reduced dimensionality. And then Lagrange multipliers who are a way also of solving problems with equality constraints but by increasing the dimensionality of the problem. And we will see the differences and, and uh, problems and advantages of each there. Okay, first diving into linear algebra. So everything I'm explaining today, you should have heard that already in your linear algebra courses in, in, in your bachelor studies. Uh, but anyway, let's, uh, let's remember some of these concepts. So first of all, what we want to do oftentimes is solve a linear equation. So given some matrix big A and a vector B, we look for some x that is solving this linear equation here. So Ax equals B and we want to solve for this x. And um, uh, the, the simplest way to do that is by inverting the matrix big A and then we can just add uh, A inverted to the to the left side of uh, the equation. So uh, here we can add a to the minus one and here we add a to the minus one. And then effectively um, the a inverted times a is canceling out and we have x equals a uh, to the minus one times b. And this obviously can be done when a is invertible uh, but in the usual numerical solvers that we are using, what they do in the background is they solve a smaller or they solve an easier optimization problem, meaning they solve for Ax minus B and then taking the norm of that, of that and minimizing it. And as you recall, this norm becomes only zero when um, Ax minus B is exactly the zero vector. 
and uh, it cannot get smaller than that. So there is one unique solution. Uh, uh, if ax minus b equals zero can be achieved and um, this is also then the solution to this optimization problem. This is a more robust way of solving for this, uh, for this linear equation and uh, we have several possibilities here. So if there's a single solution then this minimization problem will exactly return the x for which um, the, the norm is zero. And, uh, but there are also cases where there are infinitely many solutions. So if our matrix is uh, defined in a way that there can be more than one x solving for ax minus b, then by automatically there are infinitely many solutions because any linear combinations of these possible x's uh, would then also be a solution. Um, but uh, by solving this optimization problem, um, most implementations will then, from this collection or this space of infinitely many possible solutions here in the second case, they will return to us the solution that has itself minimum norm. And okay, so there are obviously several norms that could that we could have. So usually it will be the two norm, um, and and most implementations will then return to us. Uh, among the solutions, we'll select the unique solution that has minimum norm. And there are also cases where there is no solution. Um, so there are cases where I cannot find an x where I exactly get the result equal to b. Um, but then the uh, most libraries solving for this kind of problem will then return to me the solution that is closest. So the x that will then minimize here the, the norm distance. And um, um, well, again, this is equal to solving this, this small optimization problem one. And there are many specialized solution techniques for this. So if I know that my matrix is sparse, that my matrix has only entries on the diagonal, if my matrix is upper or lower triangular, there are very specialized solution techniques for that. And actually, um, many implementations also first do a factorization of my matrix A to get it into a form that is upper or lower triangular, uh, for example, with a Koleski decomposition. And um, this will then be uh, used as the basis for, for solving this uh, linear equation, uh, but we will not get into, into such details here. What is, however, important is the relation to the Newton method. So for the Newton method, the direction that we're taking, so the direction of the Newton step, is um, the inverted Hessian of f at x, so inverted times the negative gradient of f at x. And um, this is actually uh, just a transformed uh, linear equation that we want to solve. So again, if we then left multiply both sides with the Hessian, then here we have the Hessian um, of f times d. This should be the negative gradient f of x. So here this can also be the Hessian of fx times d plus the gradient equals to zero, so the zero vector here. And um, again, uh, we use some existing libraries usually that can solve these types of uh, problems for us. And Julia has this already built in. And how do we actually solve that? Now let's use a small example. So this makes it maybe a little bit more, more vivid. So uh, imagine that we have uh, two types of colors. We have a Bordeaux color and indigo color. And Bordeaux is mostly red with a little bit of blue. And the indigo color, it's mostly blue with a little bit of red. So here in Bordeaux, we have 20% um, of uh, blue pigment and 80% of red pigment. And for the indigo color, we have 90% of blue pigment and then 10% of the red pigment. And uh, from these two colors that we have available, we want to make a mixture and we want to get violet. And violet should contain exactly 50% of the blue and 50% of the red pigment. And the question is, how can we uh, combine and by which frac fractions should we combine the two uh, Bordeaux and Indigo colors to get exactly a violet out? And we can write this down. So we can here uh, write this down as our matrix. 
and the matrix entries are here exactly the first column for the uh, Bordeaux color and the second column for the Indigo color. And by multiplying this matrix by some x, so here we have a times x, uh, this exactly equates to uh, making a mixture, uh, making a mixture of uh, the first and the second column. So taking weights of the first and the second column and then adding that back together. And the big question here is, uh, by which x should we multiply our a so that we get out exactly 0 0.5 and 0 0.5. Okay, and um, this is in our form ax equals b and we are solving for that and in uh, Julia we have this backslash operator and the backslash operator is exactly finding the solution to this um, optimization problem one, this min norm problem and uh, will by well by by definition then also solve for ax equals b if there is a solution to that and by running that we get out uh, the following result so to get the violet color we should take 0 0.57 um, of the bordeaux content and then 0 0.42 of the inigo content and um, uh, well obviously this worked quite like quite nice uh, but uh, now let's uh, give the, the problem back to you, uh, for you to solve at home. What if we wanted to get a mixture of paint that has only blue pigment? Uh, so here we could then also solve for A times X equals um, 1.0 and 0. So to have only blue pigment and no red pigment. And uh, well, the question for you is, can we do that and uh, what would be possible problem here? Okay, moving on. Uh, determinants of a matrix. So the term determinant is mentioned oftentimes in, in scientific fields, uh, but um, most of the time it is assumed that students already know what is meant by determinants and what the properties are. We will recapitulate this here really quick. So. Let A, our matrix A, be square and then the determinant of this square matrix is the volume of a parallelogram that is spanned by the vectors AI. And what do we mean by that? Here we have our matrix big, big A and uh, we want um, here our matrix to consist of all column vectors. So we have here column vector A1, column vector A2, column vector A3. And these column vectors um, are all, we can imagine them if we are in three space uh, as, as vectors here. So this is the A1 vector uh, going from zero to some location. And then we have the A2 vector going from zero to some location. And then we have the three vector going from zero to some location here. And um, by combining these three directions, we can span a parallelogram and the determinant is then the volume of this parallelogram. Um, what is important here, the volume can also be negative. So just depending how you arrange the, the, these vectors, uh, there can in principle also be negative volume here. And there can also be zero volume. So if you imagine that this, um, this A1 vector that it was moved really closely to the location of A22, then we would like compress out the, the volume. Um, and finally, if A1 and A2 are directly on top of each other or are just a multiple of the other one, then we would have flattened out this parallelogram. We would have one, one dimensionless, quote unquote, and uh, we would then have a determinant of volume zero. And this is important because a matrix can only be inverted if its determinant is non-zero. Okay. And um, there are a couple of rules for determinants, Quite, pretty easy to remember. So determinant of A times determinant of B is the determinant of A times B. And also the, the transpose and the inversion of matrices also then translate into the, the same operation uh, performed on the determinant. Or here the, the, the transpose doesn't do anything and then if I have to take the determinant of A uh, inverted 
then it is 1 over the determinant of a. Okay. And, um, well, for us, obviously, because in the Newton method, we want to take the, the inverted of the matrix of the Hessian, uh, it is important to us that we can take this Hessian, and uh, therefore this determinant has some, has some value to us of that being non-zero. And um, the determinant being non-zero, it also is closely related to the concept of uh, linearly independent vectors and to uh, the concept of a basis. So the determinant is non-zero if these column vectors, a1, a2, a3, or however many we have, we call them a1, if they are linearly independent to one another. And uh, linear independence has the following meaning. Um, if I have my vectors ai and I want to combine them in a way that I get the zero vector, there is no non-trivial way of combining them to get the zero vector. What is meant by that? Uh, imagine I, I here I take vectors b from Rn, so I have n um, column vectors, and now I'm looking for a, a, a factor that I'm multiplying each of the column vectors with to get out um, the, the zero vector when I then sum over them. So here I take then the sum over all my column vectors. Each of my column vectors is multiplied by a scalar b, and then I'm combining all of them together and I want to get the zero vector out. And if all my column vectors are linearly independent, then the only solution to that is to have b equal to the zero vector. Yeah, but we have to be careful. Um, um, yeah, because if we don't have linear independence, then there's one other, there are other b's that also lead to, to the zero vector. Uh, in the end by combining our, our AI. Okay, in Julia it's pretty easy. In Julia we have um, a lot of um, modules or a lot of library functions already implemented for finding the basis and also for computing the determinant. So obviously there are some rules for finding the determinant, uh, but we will not do that here in this course because we can just rely on, on Julia for that, for, for the purposes that are important. Uh, as far as this lecture goes. Okay, next concept, definiteness of a matrix. We already have heard about that uh, a couple of times, but now let's see at the formal definition. So again, we have a symmetric matrix, A from R to N times N, and uh, the definition of positive definiteness is that for all my vectors X, that are not the null vector. So here I'm excluding the null vector. If I take x transposed times a times x, then the result will be larger than, the, than zero. And um, the definition of positive semi-definiteness is closely related. So again, for all my x that are not the zero vector, if I take x transposed times a times x, I have to be larger or equal to zero. And uh, we have some shorthand notation for that. Uh, so this will turn up in, in the course from time to time. We write a funny smart, larger than zero for a positive semi-definite a. And of course I can um, take the negative matrix and then go from a positive semi-definite matrix to something that is negative semi-definite and, and vice versa. And uh, identity matrix a i is always positive semi-definite semi or always positive definite, and um, yeah, sometimes we make use of the property by adding, for example, a multiple of the identity matrix uh, by choosing the multiple in a way that we are ensured in the end to get something that is positive definite. Okay, now a visual, a visual uh, image of that is always helpful. So uh, here we show again the Taylor approximation of a function at a point x. And um, the Hessian of this function is positive definite for this case um, at the point x. And we see that because the Taylor expansion, um, it, it is upwards curved. And that, that is always the sign to us that the, the second derivative or that the Hessian has, um, is positive definite. Okay, but this function uh, does not have a 
positive definite Hessian everywhere. If we choose another point, so if we go to, to a point over here, for example, then the second derivative probably would not be positive definite. Just by looking at the picture, it, it doesn't look that, that way. Okay. Um, and again, one important property, if a function is strictly convex, and if it's also twice differentiable, then everywhere will I have the Hessian positive definite. Basis, rank, and null space. Now we are getting into territory that we will use uh, for an interesting optimization problem later on in the course. So here it's a little bit of theory, we have to bear with that, but uh, we have an immediate use for, for the concepts on this slide later on in the course. I hope this will be interesting, or I'm pretty sure this will be interesting. So suppose I have a bunch of column vectors. I have a1 to a n column vectors, and all of these column vectors are linearly independent. So recall maybe what we heard about the, uh, the determinant and matrices being invertible. Now we don't necessarily have a matrix. Here just we say, okay, we have column vectors a1 to a n. And if these are linearly independent, then I call them a basis for some space that spans n dimensions that are embedded in Rm. Yeah? So here my column vectors, my ai, they have elements um, ai1 down to ai, ai m. So each of these column vectors has m entries. Okay, and if n of these column vectors are linearly independent, then they spend some n-dimensional space that is embedded in Rm, meaning um, I have all the vectors um, x from Rm that I can reach by taking some linear combination of my column vectors. So here I'm choosing there exists some b uh, such that I uh, can take the linear combination um, of the ai multiplied by the elements of B such that I recover X. So X are all the, the, the points that are reachable by taking some combination of the column vectors AI. Okay, but there are also points that are not reachable. So it could be that uh, I have uh, the AI are in a 100 uh, dimensional vector. So I have my AI here and they go from AI1 to AI100. Um, but I only have, let's say, two or three of the AI. So I only have A1, A2, and A3. And then I would effectively have, a, if they are linearly independent, I would have a three-dimensional subspace of R to 100. Okay. Um, now, Going back to matrices. Now let's say I take a matrix A that is from R to M times N. So here I have my matrix and the size of my matrix here is then I have M rows. Let's make that blue. So I have M rows and I have N columns red n columns and um, the if then I look at all the column vectors in my matrix so here then I have my a1 is here the column and my a2 is here the column and so on and then if these are a basis for some um, uh, some space that has dimension k and the dimension k has to be smaller than m or n. Um, so, um, or rather, if I take, if I look at all the points that I can reach by multiplying a times x for some x that I'm choosing, then I will find out that all the points that I can reach by a times x, they live in a k-dimensional space. And uh, this k depends um, on the um, on the uh, on whether the column vectors are linearly independent 
or to how many linearly independent column vectors I can reduce them. So it could also be that in my matrix I have a couple of uh, non-linearly independent uh, vectors, uh, but then I, I only consider the, the, the existence of some linear combination or some combination of column vectors that are linearly independent uh, who can reach the same points as I can reach with a big A times x. Okay, and I'm calling this the rank of big A. Yeah, so the rank of big A is the dimensionality of all the space of all the points that I can reach by going through A, by having A times X. Okay, um, but there can also be um, vectors Y that if I multiply A with Y, then I get to zero. And um, the points Y that get me to zero by multiplying them with big A, they are also forming a space or they are also uh, yeah they are forming a space because if i have a let me select this guy here if i have a times y1 equals to zero and i have a times y2 equals to zero then i know that a of y1 plus y2 would also equal to zero and i can then take any linear combination of uh, of uh, uh, y1 and y2 and uh, so these are then effectively also forming a space of um, of all the points that get me to zero and this is called the null space of big A. And there is now a theorem. The theorem is that the null space has dimension n minus k where n is the number of columns of my matrix and k is the rank of my matrix. Okay, how can we do that in, in Julia? So here we have a matrix big A, and um, this is a two by four matrix. So A lives in R to the two times four. And uh, here the rank of A is two, and this is also the maximum rank that A could have. So I can have at most two, um, uh, or I can uh, have at most two elements in the basis, um, um, that spans the same space that I can reach with A uh, because if I multiply some vector with A or A multiplied by some vector I only get a, a two-dimensional vector out so the, the rank can be at most two and Julia also tells me here okay the rank is two. Okay and now Julia also has a built-in functionality for computing the null space so here I say n equals the null space of A and uh, I get out a matrix, so this is something Julia does for convenience, but actually I'm, I'm looking here at, uh, at the columns or the column vectors that make up the basis of the null space. So here I have my first column vector um, with um, four, four entries, and then here I have my second column vector with four entries. And if I take any of these column vectors and multiply A by that, I get zero out. So here, uh, this syntax here is selecting all the elements of the first column and if I multiply A by that I get exactly uh, zero out so effectively that is an element of, of the null space. 